Hi everyone, this is Neil Reitertair, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. Uh, this is of a patient who attended with a swimmer's ear. So swimmer's ear is a bacterial infection of the outer ear. So it's classified as otitis externa. And it's specifically as a result of water entering the ear and causing mayhem really. And it can do so in many different ways, which I'll explain during the course of the video. Um, so they developed this infection whilst they were on holiday, they were in the swimming pool and they got water in this ear. And a couple of days later, they experienced some mortality, so ear pain. And whilst they were on holiday, they were prescribed some antibiotics. Um, initially, their symptoms worsened and they had edema, so swelling of the ear canal. It was very tender. And after the course of the antibiotics, they felt the ear pain to have subsided, if not completely alleviated, but they felt the ear was blocked. And you can see that this patient has got kind of a lot of crystallized uh, debris, dead skin, infectious debris that was uh, in the ear um, at the time they developed the infection. And in a moment, I'm going to retrieve a quite a huge plug of epidermal skin. It almost looks like a caterpillar. And I think it's this next bit coming up. So when you've got an infection of, of the ear, there we are, it, it leads to a higher turnover of skin formation and of course any um, skin that's formed in the, in the ear will eventually die and shed and that's because the inflammation as a result of the infection, so when you've got an infection you, you get a dilation of the blood vessels which increases blood flow but also temperature in an attempt to kind of curb the bacteria or the pathogen, uh, but that increased uh, blood flow also promotes the formation of new dead skin. In addition, the reason why the ears produce more dead skin in, uh, when you've got an infection is because the, the bacteria or the fungi has colonised on the surface of the skin, that your ear, or your body in general, wants to get rid of that outer layer of skin. So it's almost trying to uh, evict the host out of the ear. So if the outer layer of skin... Um, is infected then the ear itself produces more skin which will eventually will replace the infected skin at the surface and in an attempt to decolonize and evict the host bacteria fungi so this patient has had a high turnover of, uh, of dead skin which is then formed into a, an epidermal plug and i was occluding the ear that also caused a lot of humidity sweat moisture uh, because obviously the patient did get water in the ear as well and it's trapped that so you can see underneath this dead infected layer of skin that's kind of crystallized almost, the patient's got a, more of a healthier skin. Now the underlying skin was still very dry, uh, but already the patient can hear so much better. But what I want to do now is get all of this uh, residual uh, uh, dead skin that's crystallized. Some of it was quite gooey, particularly immediately on the eardrum, which is a bit more difficult to remove. Um, I have also recommended the patient, uh, after I've removed all this, just to apply some acetic acid in the ear because um, whenever they get water in the ear, it washes away some uh, natural acids that are formed in the ear. And the acids are quite important because um, the acids uh, prevent uh, pathogenic bacteria um, non-native, because our ears are full of bacteria, uh, it's part of the skin flora, and these are healthy bacteria that are non-pathogenic um, and are able to survive in acidic conditions. But if your ear becomes more neutral, then it uh, provides an opportunity for non-native bacteria uh, from other parts of the body or in the environment to invade and colonise the ear. Because most of these pathogenic bacteria um, are at the optimal reproduction rate um, when the pH level is more neutral. They're called neutrophiles. I um, hope I've pronounced that correctly. So I've just provided some use of acetic acid spray. Now, guys, this is where I used the Rikoret, and it came. It worked a really treat, because this is quite crystallised, and I was using suction. It's very difficult to lift. I would have persuaded, and I don't want to use any drops in this ear, because it's just coming from an infection. So I wanted to keep, make it a complete dry procedure without any using drops. Sometimes you, you have to, if you, but um, the Rikoret is really worked a treat, because not only does it help me to peel away skin like this, but it's extremely robust. And I can remove really hardened lumps of wax with it. So it's got a dual function. 
the tip of the carette is a lot more tapered, it's a lot more narrowed um, than the rest of it. And that tip you can see now, I'm using to good effect. I'm using it to glide in between this crystallized skin and the canal wall. And the curvature of the carette also mimics the curvature of the canal wall. So when I'm gliding it, there's less friction. Um, and it's honestly works a treat. Um, when I first developed it, of course, there's going to be some bias on my part, but um, putting that bias aside, I mean, it speaks for itself. Um, I've also had some really good feedback about it from other specialists, including ENT consultants. And what really helps is the angulation. So there's a bend on the instrument. Um, a lot of these uh, instruments are straight, which can affect your maneuverability in the ear. Uh, so when you've got an angulation, so a bend on the instruments, it really frees up. Um, the entry point and it just allows you more manipulation both ends of the instrument have got this uh, uh, the correct it's a double-ended instrument and it's got the same design on each end but on the opposite um, direction so that allows me 360 access to all parts of the ear so if I want the bend to be the other way then I just turn the instrument 180 degrees and enter that side um, you could potentially obviously just turn it from this side, but then because of the bend, it can become a bit obstructive. So hence why you need it on both sides. Um, so you can see it really helped. I've just gone back for this bit now with the, because I've peeled it away just to get the big chunks away with the suction probe. Now, guys, if you're from the UK, whether you're watching on YouTube, TikTok, uh, Instagram or Facebook, um, if you're from the UK, if you can kindly visit my YouTube channel, um, so just type in the Wax Whisperer, the hair clinic. And if you're already on YouTube, um, go to my channel and there's a community button. If you can select the community button, uh, I'm conducting a poll and I don't want to give too much away, but if you can visit that and just complete the poll, it's just a binary yes or no. Uh, I'll be very, very grateful indeed. And I'll explain a bit later on um, during the week or next week um, why I've asked you that question. So... Uh, that'd be fantastic. So yeah, pop along to my YouTube channel, The Wax Whisperer, or type in The Hair Clinic, or type in my name, Neil Reiterter, or Neil Earwax. I'm sure the algorithms on YouTube will hopefully direct you to my YouTube channel. I've got two. I've got the Clear Wax channel, so not that one, but if you go the one with, that says The Wax Whisperer, that'd be great. So you can see the, the difference already. Um, it's just this last bit now on the eardrum. This is a more complex bit. This is a bit more moist and macerated. So... I'm going to explain now why water is bad for you. And I've done it many, many times over, but there's always new people joining the channel. And this is probably for me, if I was to give one single advice to anyone about the ears, this is the advice I'd give, is to avoid water in your ear. And the reason for that, or there's several reasons. Water um, in the ear can, first of all, macerate the skin and damage the outermost layer of skin. So the outermost layer of the skin, the epidermis, it itself has four layers. And the very most outer layer is uh, a layer called the stratum corneum. And it's made up of dead skin cells. So these skin cells, they are like fish scales. There's about 10 to 15, maybe even more layers of this skin. And they're like, as I said, fish scales. And they're interconnected. There's little bonds between them, uh, adhesions. Um, and... Um, first of all, water through hydrolysis can break down these adhesions. So it can start uh, breaking down the outer layer of skin. The outer layer of skin is so important, it's your protective barrier from the outside harsh environments we're in. So it protects you from chemicals, bacteria, fungi, harmful UV rays. So through the, through the hydrolysis itself, it can break down these uh, adhesive bonds and uh, break down that structural network of uh, dead skin cells at the surface also within the and these de skin cells at the surface are called corneokites within those it's not only keratin now keratin actually it's an interesting thing that i've learned it's 40 percent hydrophilic and 60 percent hydrophobic so overall it's it's slightly more hydrophobic um but also contained within the um corneokite skin cells are which is there's no nucleus in there there's no living organelles it's just keratin and it's full of what we call natural moisturizing factors and they are typically acids uh, and proteins so uh, they're free amino acids in there carbolytic acid um, 
uric acid, so urea, and these uh, are hydrophilic, so they absorb water molecules, and they can absorb apparently up to, th- I think it's, is it three times? Uh, I'll have to double check that. Um, let me just. I think it's three times its weight in water, if I'm correct. But that's not good. Now, you want these natural moisturising factors to just attract and bond to enough moisture in the environment to help moisturise that outer layer of skin. So that outer layer of skin, as you can imagine, it's it's starved of all the blood supply. It's a dead skin cell, so it's full of keratin, so it can become quite dry. And then that will mean the physical appearance of your skin won't look good. So these natural moisturising factors, they N um MFs, they just attract enough moisture um, to keep the cor- uh, corneocytes hydrated enough. Now, if you if they get overhydrated, these corneocytes, what will happen? Because as I said, it can uh, absorb it three times its own mass in water. The corneocyte swells and it bursts um, from the membrane. So when it bursts from the membranes, obviously you've got the mas- maceration of the skin. And that's another way the outer layer of skin is breached, it's damaged. Now, very interestingly, these natural moisturising factors, although they're hydrophilic, they're also water-soluble. So if you've got too much water in your ear, these natural uh, moisturising factors, uh, which are mainly acidic, they get um, dissolved away and they get leached away, which then means the outer layer of skin, ironically, so if you have too much water in the ear, the net effect is that eventually that skin will become very dry because you don't have these hydrophilic molecules to absorb just enough moisture to keep the skin hydrated. So in the long term, your skin becomes very, very dry and cracked. Now, um, also on the um, outer layer of skin, you've got uh, lipids that are secreted, not only by these corneocyte cells that live on the surface of the skin, these dead skin cells, because they were previously called... uh, uh, keratinocytes and in the stage three the stratum granulosum uh, stage there's different these keratinocytes uh, eventually become dead skin cells called corneocytes we call that process corneocornification so they go through this cell cycle where they kind of uh, self-destruct and that that third stage the, the, the third out of the fourth they release lipids and what these lipids do they they also help to bond these corneocytes these flat skin cells that are dead at the surface it's uh, it's almost like bricks and mortar so the bricks are these little uh, skin flakes and the mortar is these lipids and also obviously our ears produce sebum uh, which is an oily lipid secretion that also uh, is secreted on our, all over our body actually but most we normally associate it on our scalp so it helps to moisturize the skin itself and also cerumen, which is uh, an oily sweat secreted by the modified apocrine glands, the same glands that we find under our armpits and genitalia. And water itself, if it's such if it's warm water, it can wash away these lipids, it can wash away sebum, it can wash away the cerumen. So these lipids are very important in moisture regulation because they sit on the surface of the skin. It helps internal moisture of the skin to be retained because it's hydrophobic, so any water moisture within the deeper layers of skin, they can't rise to the surface because you've got this lipid layer. Um, so it helps the internal moisturization of your skin. Um, and it also helps repel external water that we don't want, excessive water. But in the absence of these, uh, these oils and sweats and lipids, then internal moisture deep in the deeper layers of skin rise to the surface and they evaporate, so you get dry skin. So, and of course, water uh, can carry um, potentially uh, gram-negative bacteria, and the gram-negative bacteria can be very pathogenic. So there's two types of bacteria. You've got gram-positive, so the most bacteria, the native bacteria that live without much difficulty and harm in the ear, um, the non-pathogenic bacteria are gram-positive, and you can get gram-negative. So what's the difference? So a gram-positive bacteria has a very thick cell membrane, whereas a gram-negative has a very thin cell membrane. However, the gram-negative bacteria is encapsulated in a lipid lipid molecule, a lipid capsule. So it's actually very well protected. Um, It's very difficult for antibiotics to penetrate that lipid capsule to kill the bacteria. 
And these gram-negative bacteria also can mutate and become resistant to the uh, uh, antibiotic. And it can also, once it has become resistant, it can share that genetic uh, uh, DNA to neighbouring gram-negative bacteria. So uh, that's why gram-negative bacteria are quite difficult to treat with antibiotics as they become highly resistant because of their lipid capsule layer and their ability to mutate and then also pass on that information of how it's mutated against the antibiotic to neighbouring gram-negative uh, bacteria. So water uh, does, have, does contain some um, pathogenic gram-negative bacteria. So guys, we're not going to get every little spec. What I'm doing now is actually, I'm really, really pleased. It's, I'm just trying to get as much out as possible, but you can see we're right up against the eardrum and um, it's just not possible. It, it's impossible to get all this out. The only way you'll get this out is by potentially squirting water out, water in, which is one of what, what this has got this patient in the situation they have. They had developed a swimmer's ear, so it got water in the ear, which then led to infection. And I've described all those ways in how water can potentially cause harm. So guys, avoid water. Please, 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 please. I can't stress that enough. It's my number one advice. I, I honestly believe if we can avoid water entering our ears, then the number of ear infections, would be, I can't tell you how much it would be reduced by, but it would be significant. And all I'm seeing at the moment is ear infections. I had this patient, I had another patient who attended with a auricular hematomas, also known as a um, cauliflower ear. And they also had swimmer's ear because they got water in the ear recently. So, well, I hope you enjoyed that video, guys, and all the information about the bacteria and how water can affect your ears and the natural moisturising factors and the different layers of skin. Uh, do take care, keep well, and speak soon. Bye.